The one agenda item that I want to bring back is the Secretariat. If I take you back to the Stanmore Second Executive Council meeting, there were a number of councillors who brought up the idea that a lot of uh, what, what we've classed non-mainstream uh, ideas are circulating and affecting our youth. Uh, and the Executive Council asked uh, the Secretariat to look into this. The President then asked Sheikh Ali Dina uh, to look into this matter and to conduct a much more detailed investigation and come back uh, to the Karachi Executive Council. Many of you were also at Karachi, so you will recall uh, quite a detailed presentation was given by Sheikh Ali Dina. Uh, when we left Karachi, we asked Sheikh Aladina to continue the work, but also to liaise with the highest authorities of the Shia Madhab, including our Marja Ayatollah uh, Sistani. So I'm going to ask Sheikh Aladina to walk us through uh, what has happened since the Karachi Exco uh, to, the, to now. Um, he can summarize the whole issue again, but um, I want him to give the update, uh, and then we will take it forward. Please, can we welcome Sheikh with a loud salawat? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين The Honorable President of the Federation and the office bearers, the respected councillors and guests, the honorable ulama who are in attendance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I would like to uh, take this opportunity before I give an update of the investigation and the report as an important reminder that as a community, we have a duty which Allah has guided us in the Quran. In Surah Ali Imran, Allah reminds us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqullah haqqa tuqatih. O believers, if you want salvation, then you should be God mindful, God conscious, understand your duties, and try to implement them in the best manner possible. Be it avoiding the haram, be it performing the wajib. Beyond that, be it avoiding the makruh and doing the mustahab. Beyond that, be it avoiding even the mubah for the sake of getting closer to God. Be it reaching a stage where your whole life now, your thoughts, your feelings, your likes, your dislikes, they're totally dedicated to God and God alone. That's the ultimate and the highest goal. And you must persevere and continue to do so if you want salvation, because it is only godliness, not attachment to anything other than God. Only godliness that will bring about salvation and but you will face challenges challenges that will prevent you to become godly and to remain godly make sure you persevere on this path till the end because shaitan and the other forces will definitely try to divert you right up to the point of your death and then the next ayah reminds us that in order to achieve this godliness, don't do it individually, but do it as a community. Jamia. 
in order to become godly, we have to raise ourselves. And in order to raise ourselves, we need an, an agent, a factor that will take us closer to God. The metaphor mentioned in the Quran is the rope of God. Anything that connects us to God, God's message, the Quran, God's messenger, the prophet, the uh, inheritors, spiritual inheritors of the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, and in the Ghaibah of the last Imam, the Maraji'ah. Hold on to the rope of God and, and, and understand it and practice it so that you can raise yourself closer to God. But don't do it alone. There are many things you cannot achieve singularly. You need collective effort. وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Collectively. Collectively understand the Qur'an. Collectively understand the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of the Ahlul Bayt Alaihim Collectively discuss and debate how you are going to implement it at a social level, parental level, and a global level. But beware, there will be forces that will prevent you from becoming godly even on a collective level. وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And don't be divided. You will be pulled apart because of selfish reasons, because of your desires, because of the dunya, because of the devil. Beware. Do not get split. And the ayah then says, Kojas, remember your past. Sorry, the ayah is talking about the Muslims at the time in Medina when the ayah was revealed. But then it applies to all times. Kojas, remember your history. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءَ فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ Remember, there was a time before you had converted to the truth. At that time, you were on a path that would have led you to doom and damnation. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِّنْهَا Allah is the one who facilitated for you to get guidance, to see the truth, to understand the truth, to accept the truth. And that saved you from damnation. So once you have this personal desire to become godly and to remain godly till the end of your life, and once you, ha you re realize the importance of collective community effort in order to hold on to God's rope, to, to understand collectively God's message, to understand the model of the prophet, to debate and discuss how to implement and live that godly life, now you are ready to become the ambassadors of God to, to, to spread the message of godliness to the rest of the world. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ The next ayah. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Whatever is good, virtuous, godly, perfecting, prosperous, beneficial, you should be in the forefront as a community to understand it, to learn it, to practice it, and to spread it, and to advocate it, and to support it, and to educate others, and to facilitate the performance of that goodness. And also identify what's wrong and evil and detrimental and will take you away from godliness and perfection and will divide you and will destroy you. Understand that. Avoid that in your personal lives. Avoid that in your community life. And then advocate and preach to the others and warn to the others to avoid these factors. You want to know who is ultimately going to be victorious and successful and triumphant in the dunya. And of course, in the akhirah, these are the qualities which are required. With this background and this reminder about our important duty that God is expecting from us, based on the mandate that was given by the WF leadership and by the counselors, when we were faced by certain 
questions of differing opinions, alternative opinions about religion, about aqidah, about history, about the Quran, about some fatwas. There was a concern which was raised in the community, which was channeled to the leadership, and the counselors then mandated us in the Islamic Education Department to investigate and to consult with the highest authority. It is natural to have differences of opinion and understanding. It is something that the Quran has acknowledged that even in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was difference of opinion in the way people understood the role of the Prophet, in the way the people wanted to follow the Prophet, in the way, God forbid, they congregated to oppose the Prophet. Amir al-Mu'mineen gives us an insight into some of the reasons why differences could arise. So in one of the khutbas in Nahj al-Balagha, Imam alayhi salam says, spread and scattered amongst the people are hadith regarding the Prophet. Some of them are true, some of them are false. And you have different fatwas in the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Some hadith are latest hadith, some are older hadith, some are abrogating, some are abrogated. Some are general principles, some are conditional principles. Some are clear guidelines. Some are ambiguous, which need clarification. Some are properly understood. Some have been misunderstood. They're all these hadith are there amongst the companions of the Prophet in the time of Ali salam. And then he says, let me explain to you four reasons why these differences are there. Reason number one, he says, unfortunately, in the Muslim community, we had companions who were liars, who didn't believe in the Prophet. And therefore, they deliberately misquote him. And these hadith have been entered into the general public circulation, and innocent next generation or young people receive it, and they don't realize that had they known the reporter is unreliable and a liar, they would not have accepted it. Second reason for these differences of opinion, Imam salam says, is there is a reporter, he's not a liar, he's innocent, he is uh, he's sincere, but he's a partial reporter. Meaning that he saw the Prophet and he heard the Prophet, but he didn't understand the Prophet well. Or he saw the Prophet, he understood him, but he forgot later on when he transmits that report to the next generation, he forgets certain crucial parts, and the next generation mistakes the message from the Prophet. And then there's a third reason for differences of opinion, the difference of fatwa in the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, is that you have a reporter, sincere, innocent, tr tr uh, reporting correctly, but he's reporting only half the story because the full story did not reach him. He was there for part of the time with the Prophet. For another time, he was absent, and he didn't realize that that particular hadith he's quoting was a temporary regulation given by the Prophet. He missed out the final version. And then Imam salam mentions the fourth and the final reporter of the hadith. And he is the one who is true and sincere and faithful and fearful of God and cognizant of his duty and responsibility that he has to be able to listen to the prophet attentively, understand him correctly. If there's any ambiguity, ask for clarification, retain it, record it, transmit it without any addition or subtraction or interpolation or adulteration. And then, of course, he introduces himself that he belongs to this group who was with the Prophet right from the time when the declaration of the prophecy began till the time the soul departs from the Prophet's holy body. So differences of opinion were there right in the time of the Prophet and Imam Ali salam, and the factors multiplied further in the time of the Imams salam. Now, if God expects from us as a community, your duty is to be godly, understand God's message, and then discuss and reach a consensus, collective decision, how you as a community are going to implement God's law. But then in between, we have differences of opinion. So what should we do? And the Quran definitely understands the weaknesses of human beings, and therefore it is given as guidance. So in Surah, 
Nisa Allah says ya ayyuhallazina amanu atti'u Allah wa atti'u ar-rasul wa uli al-amri minkum In order to achieve salvation follow the command of God who is the source of all wisdom and goodness and perfection and follow his representative on the earth the last messenger and after the last messenger follow and obey the commands and the guidance of those vested with authority to guide you which is the imams of the ahlul bayt alayhim salam but then in the time of the imams we had problems whereby different companions reported from the imams different hadith deferring hadith contradictory hadith so what do we do whose fatwa should we follow amongst the companions again the guidance in the quran and the ahlul bayt is فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ When there's a difference of opinion, and that difference leads to disagreement, and that disagreement leads to a conflict. Well, there's a dispute. You've got a dispute in family matters, in financial matters, in religious matters. فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ Then the solution is فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ then refer back to the book of God, refer back to the established, clear, credible, authentic sunnah in the model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa So our duty therefore, in kuntum tu'minuna billahi wal yawmil akhir. What is your intent and motive? Do you really believe in God? You see all these differences of opinions and disputes. Do you believe in God? Do you think God wants to misguide you and confuse you or no he is wise he is all loving he's all merciful he's all knowing he understands your problems and therefore he's going to show you a method of solving your problems of disputes and differences do you believe that there is a day of accounting you will be asked on that day the Quran reminds us and warns us that when you were faced with confusion and ambiguity and multiplicity and plurality of opinions did you carry out your duty towards God diligently and did you investigate and find out the right guidance so then Allah then concludes this ayah by saying Zalika khair. this method of resolution of differences of opinion is the best way forward no sorry sorry I'm not translating accurately Zalika khair No, it is the only way forward It's not the better and the best We have a choice We may use this method or some other method Khair, it is the only method And, and incidentally Wa ahsanu ta'awila You want to ensure collectively As a community, as a nation, as a globe You will not end up in divisiveness In damnation, in failure This is the method to follow and therefore, acting on this guidance, we collected uh, the report about different opinions, different fatwas, different views about aqaid, about history, about the Quran. And uh, after the uh, Karachi uh, Exco, we sent the document to the office of the Marja in, in Najaf. Uh, we had it translated into uh, Farsi and uh, obviously the office of the marja requested for time to study the document um, incidentally may i remind you it was not only the initiative of um, the world federation leadership or, or the councillors mandate we discovered that agha's office was also being contacted by different other people and therefore at one stage even Agha's office requested us to investigate and to collect the views and to report back to them. So we sent the report, and after a period of time, several weeks, an appointment was granted to us to go and visit Agha. Uh, initially, I thought I'll be going uh, alone, but alhamdulillah, I discovered on the day of arrival there that Pramukh Sahib Al-Hajj Anwar Bayda Ramsi also deemed this to be such an important visit that he also made the effort to attend and plus um, we requested uh, al-hajj uh, sheikh safdar by jafar because of his um, uh, past relationship and involvement in these uh, issues so the three of us we visited Agha. 
The amazing thing was that um, these, his comment on the report was that these are not something new. These thoughts, these alternative opinions, uh, be it in Aqaid, be it in Fiqh, be it in history, be it in Quran, these are already in circulation from other sources also. The, the Farsi Shia speaking world has alternative thinkers. The Arabic speaking Shia world has alternative thinkers. Um, so he's well informed. It wasn't something new. In fact, we discovered that Agha has a whole hierarchical system of, of monitoring, of collecting, and of understanding what are the different issues and questions out there. So uh, would you believe that there are almost 20 or more research centers operating under his office? About 20 or so in Qom, a research center in Aqaid, research center in history, research center in Hadith, research center in uh, philosophy and other fields. Medicine also, astronomy. One of the only offices perhaps that has a telescope in Qom is Agha's office. Um, and, and Najaf also, I later on discovered that there are a, a few research centers with scholars engaging uh, in responding to some of the issues uh, of the day. And so we met one of the heads of these institutes, research institutes, and he told us, uh, we, for example, we monitor the questions against the Shia mezhab, for example, from the Wahhabis or from other sources. So he says, for example, we've managed to collect over time uh, almost 6,000 questions. M many of them are repetitive, so then we narrow it down to those which are non-repetitive, almost about 400 questions. Of these 400, then we prioritize almost about 200 or so. These 200 we send to the marja. Oh, the marja is updated. So the few 10, 20, 30 questions we sent to him, <laughs> His awareness is much beyond that. And, and, and this testimony I heard about his awareness of what is happening at a global level. We have scholars, for example, uh, an expert in theology is in, in, in Qom. I met one of his students. He says, when my teacher, the expert in theology, visited Najaf for Ziyara, he got the opportunity to, to meet Agha. Remember, Agha's specialty is in, in fiqh and usul. This scholar is an expert in theology. When he went to meet Agha, Agha tells him, I've read your books. And may I advise you? And then he gives him some advice. This, this expert, when he comes back, he tells his student, I'm amazed. This man is well informed. Um, Politically, I, you must have read in the news when, when the uh, occupation of Iraq took place temporarily for the couple of years after the invasion and the fall of Saddam, um, the issue of uh, political involvement and democracy and one man, one vote came up, and, but the occupiers had a different plan. The UN representative, Lakhdar Ibrahimi, was sent to meet Agha. Uh, so Agha tells him, but uh, Lakhdar, in your so-and-so book on this page, haven't you said that democracy means one man, one vote? And the man was taken aback that this old man sitting here is aware. Molana, Molana Rizwi, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Rizwi, may Allah protect our ulama, he shared with me the experience that when the ulama from North America went to meet Agha, and he shared with him that the office of Agha in Lebanon has standing instructions. All the latest editions of new thinking in specific fields have to be scanned and monitored, and a copy has to be sent to Najaf. Agha is well abreast with developments, be it in politics, be it in history, and of course, be it in theology or the other areas. Professor Feldman, Noah Feldman, he was the advisor, the legal advisor to the occupying authority in, in Iraq. In an article that he wrote, he says, the single person, well informed, who managed to influence the democratic movement in Iraq, and he, he, he categorically mentions Hazrat al Sistani. May Allah protect our marajah. 
So of the multiple questions that we sent, it seemed that they picked up a few questions. And they said, these are the questions that are plaguing your, your community. And our response to that is that these are not new issues. We already know about them. Maybe you, as a Koja community, are experiencing it for the first time. But, but, but these are specialist issues, meaning that you need a specialist who is trained for years, if not decades, in the field to be able to investigate and do research and come up with an expert opinion. It is not something that has to be shared in the uh, uh, general public platform, which is attended by the laity and the ordinary masses who are not trained and educated in religious matters. So yes, uh, we may have in the audience people who are educated in other fields. They're experts, they're trained, but they're not trained with the critical tools of evaluation and assessment and judgment and opinion formation in this particular field of fiqh or usul or aqaid uh, or Quran. And therefore these issues should be discussed in an academic institution not from the member for the general public. And the principles of investigation and evaluation and opinion forming should be established, well-researched, well-debated, well-critiqued principles that the Shia mazhab has inherited from generations, from the time of the Imams السلام, who guided their companions how to think, how to deduce, how to uh, extract God's law from the message of the Prophet and from the message of God. Incidentally, we are blessed with a marja who has inherited this legacy. If you look at the history of Shia thinking, the top experts in the Shia world, around the time, the last century, we had three major schools of thinking. Uh, one was in Mashhad. Hazrat al-Sistani is originally from Mashhad. He attended that school of thinking and learned from the best teachers there. Before he went to Najaf, in the 60s, he also came to Qom. And the dominant uh, fiqhi usuli thinking there was that of Marhum Ayatollah Buru Jardi. The older generation must have made his taqlid. Hazrat Ayla Sistani was a top student under Agha Buru Jardi. His meth methodology was adopted by Agha. And finally, he came to Najaf, where under he was trained in the dominant Najafi thinking. But, interesting, Agha Sistani did not only learn from Agha Khui, he also learned from other teachers who were also trained by that previous generation of teachers who trained Khui, but Marum Ayatollah Khui, for example, was impressed more by one teacher. Ayatollah Sistani went for for. for variety for differences and he understood the variety of approaches in the methodology and the depth of extraction currently currently amongst the oldest generation of maraji he's unique in that he represents the top thinking across the board and so we were blessed with this uh, visit and he shared uh, with us his own personal Differences that he had with his teacher, Marhum Atlahoui, Rahmatullah. Incidentally, the World Federation, the first Islamic laws edition of Agha's Fatwa, Islamic laws, which was done by Marhum Mullah Asra Sahib. If you recall, on some masail, there was some sort of a mark to indicate in this mas'ala, our Sistani differs from his teacher, our Khoi. But to the credit of our Sistani, when our Khoi was alive, he did not publish his book of laws. When Ahui was alive, he definitely had those differences of opinion with his teacher. And well researched. Yes, you sit with your teacher, you try to debate and you discuss, but then you have your differences. But out of respect for the centrality of the authority of the Shia world and the marja'iya of Sayyid al Khoi, which was accepted by the majority, he did not go in public to oppose or to defer with Sayyid Khoi, uh, Rahmatullah Alayh. So I, I don't want to go into uh, details of the issues that were 
extracted by Agha's office from the document and the dossier and the report that we presented to him. But I've discovered that on several issues, so for example, on the issue of religious uh, pluralism, if you recall, in the Karachi Exco, I said pluralism has different dimensions. There is the epistemological, the eschatological, the social pluralism. Social pluralism meaning that there is diversity of faiths in the societies we live in, but the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt have guided us that have peaceful coexistence with others. So long as they are not unjust, aggressive, oppressive, you can trade with them, you can live with them, you can interact with them peacefully, respectfully, politely. Epistemological pluralism is that, no, there's not one truth, but there's multiple truths. There are different faiths, and all the faiths have some truth, and therefore, whichever faith you follow, there's chance for salvation. And the eschatological one, of course, is the salvation in the akhirah. And then there is one group which all the ulama accept, and I, and I got this from the uh, Maraja in uh, Najaf, and I got this from the Maraja in, in Qom also. And I was told that even the Sunni ulamas accept that if for whatever reason a person who's not a Muslim has not received the information about Islam, and therefore he innocently follows his own faith, because he has not shown any obstinate, stubborn refusal to accept the truth, there is chance for salvation. That is accepted by all the ulama. The question is the epistemological pluralism. And this is not accepted by our ulama, all the top maraji that we met. I will not go into the details of the, which eye of the Quran and which hadith, but the scholars that we consulted, Azad Adla Jawadi Amuni, Azad Adla Misbah Yazdi, Azad Adla Makarim Shirazi, Azad Adla um, of course, in, in Najaf, uh, Sheikh Isaac Fayyaz and uh, Sayyid, Muhsin, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Saeed Al-Hakim and Hafiz Bashir Sahib, may Allah protect our maraji, all of them gave us a similar response. However, the interesting thing is, Hawza does not stifle dissent or differences of opinion. It encourages debate. So, for example, in Qom, there are scholars who are inviting these alternative thinkers to come and debate the issue of pluralism. So, for example, there's a scholar by the name of Shabistari, uh, Muhammad Mushtari Shabistari. He has an opinion about pluralism which is different from the dominant, prevalent view about pluralism in the Hausa. He's been asked to come and discuss and to debate, not with the Maraje, that is still a high level, even with the students of the Maraje. But for some reason, our Shabistari has not uh, shown up. And, and the other issues, is the, is the Quran eternal uh, or no, it's a historical document and some of the verses of the Quran need to be uh, deactivated or reinterpreted. Again, the dominant thinking in the Hawza, both in Najaf and Qom was that, no, the Quran is eternal in its message. It's not contextual because because there are many verses in the Quran for which we don't have any evidence of context. There is no reason of revelation. There are many verses, there are many events that have happened that don't have an ayah in the Quran. So their understanding is that the Quran is not shaped by history because of the socio-political, geographical, cultural uh, influences the Quran has been revealed in a particular way. No, rather the Quran is not shaped by history. The Quran shapes history. The Quran is a counterculture document. It criticizes the culture that was prevalent there. There are certain practices which are not acceptable and therefore speaks up and stands up against it and, and tells the Prophet, you will face opposition, but this is how you should uh, oppose it. Essentially, the question is, are we looking at the Prophet as a man who is like an ordinary person influenced by the birth and the place and the social circumstances and how he was brought up and therefore whatever he receives from Jibreel is shaped by his mind and heart or no? He has a dimension to his existence whereby he is transcending 
the limitations of society, of upbringing. He lives, he has a dimension to his existence which can elevate itself to become timeless and to receive timeless guidance, which is applicable to all times. Of course, this is a detailed uh, discussion. I don't want to go into that, but I would just like to quote one sample. So one of the extracts they had from the report is the issue of Diyah. There are some fatwas by some mushtais in Qom that the Diyah and the blood money of women should not be half of men, it should be equal to the blood money of men. Interestingly enough, this issue was supposed to be tabled for discussion in the, in the parliament in Iran, uh, Majlis al-Shuraya Islami. One of the maraji in Qom sent a report, sorry, this is not in your jurisdiction. The discussion, it's, uh, the expertise required for this discussion is not in the legislators elected as members of parliament. This is for the maraja, this is for the mushta is to do. And don't, and don't you think that um, the so-called perception of inequality in the dia between men and women is something against the dignity of a woman. This fatwa is ijma', the number of riwayat proving it are plentiful, almost mutawatir, both the Sunni and the Shia fuqaha accept it, and there is a philosophy and there's a reason behind this, and he explains it to the members of parliament, what that philosophy is for this particular law. So in conclusion, I would like to say, I'd like to share with the counselors here, but which uh, Pramukh Sahib has shared already with the regional uh, heads of the federations. Agha's advice was that differences of opinion by alternative thinkers have to be examined in a specialist circle, institution, hausa, by competent, well-qualified, well-certified uh, mujtahids. It is not for the general audience of people who are not trained to be able to critically evaluate these issues. The member he advises us, and which Pramukh Sahib has informed the, count, the, um, the heads of the regional federations, the member should not be a place for your personal ijtihad. You have the right to your own ijtihad, but the member should not be the place for it. The place for it is the academic institutions and the Hausa. The Muballigh, whom the leaders of the community are advised to invite, Agha said. The Muballigh's duty is to strengthen the faith of the believers, to bring taqwa in them, to make them more virtuous, to develop good akhlaq, to remove the vices from their life, to enhance their spirituality based on the clear verses of the Quran and the Hadith and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt And therefore he warned and he reminded us that the duty of the World Federation leaders and the community leaders and the parents and the believers in general, their duty is to make sure such issues by alternative thinkers are not allowed in the public area. But in the academic institutions, there is no problem. So the duty is invite the mainstream uh, mobiles who can educate the community in this area. My conclusion, differences of opinion are natural, they're expected. The place for debating that is not the public area by ordinary people. It is in the academic institutions. And uh, they are open. We were told by teachers in Najaf. We were told by teachers in Qom. We are ready. We are ready to discuss. Bring your thinkers. Bring your scholars. And let's listen to them. I liked the the approach of one of the mujtahids, he says, I've been in this field for 50 years. I've done a lot of research, and I feel the majority of my opinions are defensible. However, I'm not claiming I'm 100% true. I could have some opinions which could be argued against. 
I'm ready to listen. This is a man who is in 60s or 70s, 50 years he's in research. He says, I'm, I am open and available. Bring your scholar who has differences of opinion. Let's listen to him. Let us have a debate, but in a, an academic environment. Conclusion. As a community, we have a great duty to perform, as I uh, mentioned in my opening. Allah is inviting us to godliness, not, uh, not singularly, but collectively. Collectively, we need to understand the Quran and the message. Yes, we need to debate and discuss if there's a difference of opinion, but in its proper forum in the academic institutions. Let's have unity as a united collective body holding on to the book of God as interpreted by the top experts in the field. Together, we can then change ourselves, change our families, change our community, become better people, and then the message is we spread this to the rest of the world, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.